The Saga of Gunlau, Serpent Tongue. This is the saga of Hafen and of Gunlaug, Serpent Tongue, as told by the priest Ari Thorgilsson, the learned, who was the most knowledgeable of stories of settlement and other ancient law of anyone who has lived in Iceland. Chapter 1 There was a man named Thorstein. He was the son of Eil, the son of Skatnagrim, the son of the Hersir Kveldul from Norway. Thorstein's mother was named Asgert. She was Bjorn's daughter. Thorstein lived at Borg in Borgafjord. He was rich and powerful chieftain, wise, tolerant and just in all things. He was no great prodigy of either size or strength as his father Eil had been. Learned men say that Eil was the greatest champion and duelist Iceland has ever known and the most promising of all the farmer's sons, as well as a great scholar and the wisest of men. Thorstein too was a great man and was popular with everyone. He was a handsome man with white blonde hair and fine piercing eyes. Scholars say that the Mirror folk, the family descended from Ale, were rather a mixed lot. Some of them were exceptionally good looking men, whereas others are said to have been very ugly. Many members of the family, such as Kjartan Olafsson, Killer Bardi, and Skuli Thorsteinsson, were particularly talented in various ways. Some of them were also great poets, like Bjorn, the champion of Hitardal people, of the Hitardal people, the priest Einar Skulason, Snorri Sturluson, and many others. Thorstein married Jofrid, the daughter of Gunnar Hlifardsson. Gunnar was the best fighter and athlete among the farmers in Iceland at that time. The second best was Gunnar of Hlidarendi and Steinthor from Eiri was the third. Was the third. Jofrid was 18 years old when Thorstein married her. She was a widow having previously been married to Thorot, the son of Tunga Ott. It was their daughter, Hungert, who was being brought up at Borg by Thorstein. Jofrid was an independent woman. She and Thorstein had several children, although only a few of them appear in this saga. Their eldest son was named Skulli, the next Kolsvein, and the third Eil. Chapter 2 it is said that one summer a ship came ashore in the Gufua estuary. The skipper or shipper was a Norwegian named Bergfinn, who was rich and getting on in years. He was a wise man. Farmer Thorstein rode down to the ship. He usually had the greatest say in fixing the prices at the market, and that was the case this time. The Norwegians found themselves lodgings, and Thorstein himself took the skipper and since Bergfinn asked him if he could stay at his home, Bergfinn was rather withdrawn all winter, but Thorstein was very hospitable to him. The Norwegian was very interested in dreams. One spring day, Thorstein asked Bergfinn if he wanted to ride with him up to Valkel. The Borgefjord people held their local assembly there in those days and Thorstein had been told that the walls of his boot had fallen in. The Norwegian replied that he would indeed like to go and they set out later that day taking a servant of Thorstein's with them. 
they rode until they arrived at Grenjarpa, which was near Valfell. A poor man named Atli, a tenant of Thorstein's, lived there. Thorstein asked him to come and help them with their work and to bring and to bring with him a turf cutting spade and a shovel. He did so, and when they arrived at the place where the boots were, they all set to work digging out the walls. It was a hot, sunny day, and when they had finished digging out the walls, Thorstein and the Norwegian sat down inside the booth. Thorstein dozed off, but his sleep was rather fitful. The Norwegian was sitting beside him and let him finish his dream undisturbed. When Thorstein woke up, he was in considerable distress. The Norwegian asked him what he had been dreaming about, since he slept so badly. Dreams don't mean anything, Thorstein answered. Now when they were riding home that evening, I asked what Thorstein had been dreaming about. If I tell you the dream, Thorstein replied, you must explain it as it really is. The Norwegian said that he would take that risk. Then Thorstein said, I seem to be back home at Bork, standing outside the main doorway, and I look up the buildings and saw a fine beautiful swan up on the roof ridge. I thought that I owned her and I was very pleased with her. Then I saw a huge eagle fly down from the mountains. He flew towards Bork and perched next to the swan and chattered to her happily. She seemed to be well pleased with that. Then I noticed that the eagle had black eyes and claws of iron. He looked like a gallon fellow. Next I saw another bird fly from the south. He flew here at Bork, settled on the house next to the swan, and tried to court her. It was a huge eagle too. As soon as the second eagle arrived, the first one seemed to become rather ruffled, and they fought fiercely for a long time, and I saw that they were both bleeding. The fight ended, with each of them falling off the roof ridge, one on each side. They uh, were both dead. The swan remained sitting there, grief-stricken and dejected. And then I saw another bird fly from the west. It was a hawk. It perched next to the swan and was gentle with her, and later they flew off in the same direction. Then, uh, then I woke up. Now oh, this dream is nothing much, he concluded, and must be to do with the, bird, the, with the winds which will meet in the sky blowing from the directions, directions that the birds appear to be flying from. I don't think that's what it's about, said the Norwegian. Interpret the dream as seems most likely to you, Thorstein told him, and let me hear that. These birds must be the fetches of important people, said the Norwegian. Now, your wife is pregnant and will give birth to a pretty baby girl. And you will love her dearly. Noble men will come from the directions that the eagles in your dream seem to be flying from and will ask for your daughter's hand. They will love her more strongly than it's reasonable and will fight over her and both of them will die as a result. And then a third man coming from the direction from which the hawk flew will ask for her hand and she will marry him. Now I have interpreted your dream for you. I think things will turn out like that. 
your explanation is wicked and unfriendly. Thorstein replied. You, can, you can't possibly know how to interpret dreams. You see how it turns out, the Norwegian retorted. After this, Thorstein began to dislike the Norwegian, who went away that summer. He is now out of the saga. Later in the summer, Thorstein got ready to go to the Althing. Before he left, he said to his wife, Jofrid, As matters stand, you are soon going to have a baby. Now if you have a girl, it must be left out to die. But if it is a boy, it will be brought up. When the country was completely hidden, it was something of a custom for poor men with many dependents in their families to have their children exposed. Even so, it was always considered a bad thing to do. When Thorstein has said this, Jofrit replied, It is most unworthy for a man of your caliber to talk like that and it cannot seem right to you to have such a thing done. You know my temper. You know what my temper is like, Thorstein replied. It will not do for anyone to go against my command. Then he rode off to the Alfin, and Jofrid gave birth to an extremely pretty baby girl. The women wanted to take the child to Jofrid, but she said that there was little point in that and had her shepherd, whose name was Thorvard, brought to her. You are to take my horse and saddle it, Jofrid told him, and take this child with to Eil's daughter Thorgert at Hjardeholt. Ask her to bring the child up in secret, so that Thorstein never finds out about it. For I look upon the child with such love that I really have no heart to have it left out to die. Now here are three marks of silver which you are to keep as your reward. Thorgert will procure a passage abroad for you, and there in the west, out there in the west, and will give you whatever you need for your voyage overseas. <laughs>